Welcome back to One Hit Wonderland, where we take a look at bands and artists known for only one song. Viewers, why does hair metal still enchant us so? Why does it so define the decade for us? Why is eyeliner, moose, and spandex the first thing we imagine when we think of 80s rock? Why am I wearing a hair metal Halloween costume right now, one of several that I have worn on past Halloweens? Was it just because it was the dumbest and most ridiculous music of all time? Was it because it was so cool and then so lame seemingly overnight? It's, it's hard to say. But to get to the bottom of it, I think it's time for another look at the glory days of glam metal. Now most hair metal one-hit wonders came from the end of the era, where there were so goddamn many of them that Nirvana had to set off a bunch of roach bonds to get rid of them all. But today we're gonna roll all the way back to a band that was there right from the very beginning. Almost. The year is 1984, maybe the biggest year in all of pop music history. A time when giants roamed the earth, even including heavy metal. Metal had long been the music of freaks, burnouts, and outsiders. But by 84, there had begun a revolution that would make metal bands some of the biggest pop stars alive. And one of the first bands to ride that original wave of glam metal was a little band called Autograph. Which is not a good name for a metal band, let's be real. But they were there, and they were one of the first signs that heavy metal was going to be a lasting trend and a serious commercial force. Like one or two big bands, that might just be a fluke, but it's when those second tier bands creep in there that you know it's a legit trend. And Autograph proved it was when they smashed into the top 40 with their hard rock anthem, Turn Up The Radio! And Turn Up The Radio did in fact get them on the radio. It was a hit. Not a huge hit, maybe not big enough to live on on its own, but because hair metal so continues to capture our hearts, it's managed to stay somewhat alive. It's hardly top tier, but there's a lot more nostalgia for this than there is for much bigger hits of the time. But despite their early jump on the bandwagon, they would never become one of the big sellers of the 80s. And as glam kept getting more glamorous, Autograph were quickly left in the dust. I don't know how much an autograph picture of autograph is worth, but I'm guessing probably not a lot. Well, how did that happen? We're gonna find out. Crank that shit! I'm not sure where to start with this one, so why don't we start with Silver Condor? You can take my heart away tonight. Silver Condor was an early 80s soft rock band. They are a barely one hit wonder. They snuck one song into the top 40 in 1981. And here they are playing their one song. You don't have to know who any of these people are. But in 1983, lead singer Joe Sarasano fired everyone and got a whole new lineup for their second album, which immediately bit the dirt. And Joe moves on to a lifetime of recording music for beer commercials and the Hands Across America theme. However, one member of the second lineup, guitarist Steve Plunkett, decided he should have his own band. And, um, 1983 was an interesting year to start a band. For years beforehand, metal was not a major commercial force. Like, no matter how many arenas those bands packed, they weren't hit makers, they weren't household names, you didn't have to know anything about them if you didn't want to. Except maybe Ozzy, and that's only because he was constantly doing insane shit to piss people off. But in 1983, that all changed. In 83, Quiet Riot, of all groups, became the first metal band with a number one album. At least that's how it's always been reported to me. I don't know how metal they actually were, but it had metal right in the name, so there you go. Even more important than that record was Def Leppard's Pyromania, which was a huge hit on MTV with songs like Rock of Ages, Photograph. Anyway, that was going on, and meanwhile, Plunkett was jamming with some guys informally that he knew from the local session musician scene. The most important other member is a guy named Steve Lynch. And this guy is a real guitar hero. He basically wrote the book on how to shred, and I do, of course, mean that literally. So if you want to know how to do all that crazy, meatily, meatily me stuff, you can check out his numerous instructional manuals and videos. And the other guys were all in various bands that never took off that you never heard of. Like, here's the bass player playing backup for Lita Ford. Here's the drummer in some kind of lover boy sounding band. And they all got together for a little side project, recorded some stuff, gave themselves the name Autograph. 
Which, and boy, you don't have to guess how they got that name right. It's 1983, we're a hard rock band. How can we subconsciously connect ourselves to bigger bands? How about we call ourselves Autograph? Photograph, Autograph, it's perfect. That's not true for the record, that's a joke. Or at least it was a joke when I wrote it into the script. But upon further research, it's also kind of not a joke. It's a pretty widely reported urban legend about how they got their name. They swear that's not how it happened. I have my doubts. Listen, we never played a gig before in our lives, and... Uh, now, from what they've said, this sounds like an extremely informal thing that hadn't even really existed for very long. But they did lay down some tracks, and the drummer was jogging buddies with David Lee Roth. Roth heard some of their stuff, liked it, and said, Hey, why don't you guys open for Van Halen on tour? And apparently things started moving really fast. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Autograph. Okay, I will always maintain that Autograph is a lousy name for a band. They say they'd only been together a short time when the glam metal gold rush happened and labels started trying to scoop up bands left and right. The guys had to quit their other bands real quick, come up with a name on the fly, which is how they wound up with Autograph. I mean, hair metal band names are supposed to be like White Snake or Faster Pussycat, something dangerous or sexy. Autograph... I mean, I kind of get it. You know, someone wants your autograph because you're such a rock star, probably signing some hot girl's boobs, I guess. But it's still just your name written down. Might as well give yourselves the name name. I'm going off on this because I did not realize that the band had gone all in on this name. See, this is the video for their only hit. It starts with them walking onto a spaceship, the 80s, everyone, and then a robot tells them, Sign in, please which is also the name of the album. So they go give their actual autographs, and then the video turns into an advertisement for Papermate Mechanical Pencils. Like, get a good look at it. Yep, Papermate, we're in the future. The future is mechanical pencils. Get them at Kmart today. And I'm sorry, who gives their autograph in pencil? But they give the autograph, and there's a... <laughs> then there's a hilarious joke where apparently the drummer doesn't know how to read. <laughs> Sucks for you, drummer. Oh, lead guitar is never gonna be the one that has to do that gag. Anyway, here is the song, which is thankfully not about signing anything. It's called Turn Up the Radio, and it was a decent sized hit to the surprise of everyone, especially me 40 years later. Like, really? But also to the band at the time. The members of Autograph had all been through the record industry ringer by this point, so even though they were excited to have a record deal, they also had some pretty measured expectations. Considering that they chose to pay for the video with product placement, I kinda wonder if they weren't hedging their bets that they weren't gonna make back their advance. They say that Turn Up the Radio was the last song they wrote and the label didn't think much of it, but it was the one that caught on. Okay, Turn Up the Radio is a song about rock's favorite subject, itself. Hair metal also loved sex and drugs, but in the early days it was mostly about rock and roll. Yeah, you could basically get away with making songs where 40% of the lyrics was the word rock. We were this close to a song being called Rockin' the Rockity Rock Rock. Turn Up the Radio is not the most interesting entry into that genre. Honestly, I would call it pretty generic. I do like this line, though. If you don't know that one, that's a play on an old slogan for Coca-Cola. Coca that's yet another instance during this episode where advertising has come up. I gotta admit, this does sound a little bit like a commercial. A commercial for ROCK! I actually wasn't that familiar with this song before this episode, but now that I'm really listening to it, holy shit, this is such a Def Leppard ripoff. Like, it's all there. The meathead riffs, gated drums, the very Mutt Lang vocal layering. 
But the other band I hear a lot of is Foreigner. I would climb any mountain. We do it every day. So, so that's basically it. It's got the structure of a Foreigner song, the production and lyrics of a Def Leppard song, and a Van Halen guitar solo. Although Lynch is quick to point out that his two-hand shred thing is completely different from Van Halen's two-hand thing. Completely different technique, obviously. In fact, there's a funny story that Lynch tells about when they were opening for Van Halen, he was told by Van Halen's people that Lynch couldn't do his two-hand shit on stage because that two-hand shit is Eddie's thing. And eventually he confronted Eddie on it. He was like, why can't I do my two-hand shit on stage? And Eddie was like, what? Who told... I, I don't care, do whatever. I mean, it would be pretty funny if Eddie thought he was gonna stop people from copying him because that sure didn't happen. Okay, yeah, the, the song is fine, I guess. Peaked in the early months of 1985 at number 29, which, you know, it's not amazing, but it's good enough. It's a start. Uh, well, let's see that paper made sharp writer one more time. Okay, yeah, rock and roll. What happened next? It's hard to say the follow-up failed exactly because the expectations weren't very high. They had a top 40 hit, but at this point they were barely bigger than Silver Condor had been. It wouldn't like Turn Up the Radio was the biggest hit in the world. It was well outcharted by Jump, Round and Round, Rocky Like a Hurricane, We're Not Gonna Take It. These guys were not a big deal. But hey, they were bigger deals than Bon Jovi was in 1984. And since Bon Jovi got big real quick, there's no reason Autograph couldn't have kept growing too. Right? Well, let's see. This is their second song, Send Her To Me. And uh, this one has a fun video with all that hilarious 80s hair metal sexism. Now, if you're the kind of person who talks about the commodification of women's bodies, well, uh, they're literally ordering girls from a catalog. You can get offended by that if you want, but it's just so fucking stupid. Especially because none of these girls can measure up to a robot. A robot that straight up looks like Dot Matrix from Spaceballs. So yeah, this song is really not doing it for me. Like, they're trying to look the part, but for a band whose first song was about rocking, this song pretty noticeably does not rock. Just something about those cheesy harmonies. Like, who made this? I checked out who their producer was. It's a guy named Neil Kernan. Not a whole lot of notable credits there. A lot of bands I've never heard of. But in the early 80s, he developed a pretty good partnership with one band, and they were on a real hot streak. Check out this rock-ass shit he was producing. What I want, you got, it might be hard to yes, he is best known for engineering for, and then later co-producing with Hall & Oates. And we're talking, like, the really big record, so... You know, no shade, those songs are all great, but they're just not from a guy I'd recruit to make a hard rock record. But he did have some more success later in the decade with Dokken and some of Queensryche's early stuff, so maybe he's not the problem. He stuck around for the second album, so let's check that out. Here's the lead single, Blondes in Black Cars! God, these guys are picky. Sorry, brunettes in red cars. I guess you're out of luck. Yeah! Yeah, what's clear to me is that they were very lucky they got their foot in the door early. Because by the late 80s, glam metal bands had to be a lot prettier. What might have doomed these guys is that they just straight up didn't have the look. Ah! And here's the title track off that second album, That's the Stuff. Oh man, these cheesy vocals, I don't know. Like, I don't know these guys, so this could be way off, but to me, they seem like posers. Yes, even in the ridiculous and phony world of glam metal, you can be a poser. You read the backstory of Motley Crue or Guns N' Roses and it's all like, yeah, we were living in a dumpster on the Sunset Strip, doing lots of drugs, banging chicks. And these guys' backstories are like, yeah, I was doing a little session work for Boz Skaggs. 
Everything about these guys, their session musician backstories, their generic one word name, their look, their sound, all of it says to me that these guys were meant to be an AOR corporate rock band like Journey or Toto, and they wound up a hair metal band just to cash in on a trend. Except for maybe Lynch, they just don't seem very metal. They seem about as metal as me wearing this wig. That's a wig. They don't seem authentically horny and dumb like the big metal bands. I mean, this straight up sounds like a sitcom. It's a sitcom theme. What are we even doing? Not really. They show up briefly in the Kurt Cameron body swap movie, Like Father, Like Son. Oh no, my dad's in my body. Oh, you gotta take Jessica to the concert for me, dad. It's our first date. And they go and Kirk Cameron's like, oh no, it's the devil's music. Oh, it's so sinful. They're gonna teach me about evolution next. Rapture me now. Huh? Anyway, during and after their third album, Plunkett started making a lot of moves that the band didn't really like. Working with outside songwriters, firing the keyboardists, there was a lot of fighting, not much support from the label. The writing was on the wall. And so, in December of 1989, they broke up. They saw the 90s coming and they were like, nope. Peace out, making them one of the few hair bands to not be killed by Nirvana. But while most of the band avoided the humiliating fate of making hair metal in the 90s, Plunkett did go for a solo career. Hey, Louie! Here is his only single, a cover of Louie Louie. I mean, making the video about King Louis the 14th is uh, inspired. <laughs> More inspired than the cover, at least. A hair band covering Louis Louis is like sampling Rick Astley now. It's too obvious for words. And that's about it. Steve kept going as a songwriter behind the scenes. He did, in fact, write some actual TV themes. Again. I must question how metal this guy really was. And Lynch kept the band going as a zombie band where he is the only original member. Naturally. Such is the fate of all B-tier hair bands. <laughs> no. You can turn up the radio for their one song, but that is it. Allegedly, Van Halen called them a t-shirt band, aka a band that you put on as openers to give fans a chance to get out of their seats and go buy the t-shirts. Autograph was ultimately the exact kind of band that becomes a one-hit wonder. Riding trends, no real personality, make one song and dip. I wouldn't call it special, but it is fun. Good groove, good hook. If you're driving down the boulevard and comes on the radio, hell yeah, turn that shit up. Speaking of one-hit wonders from the 80s, remember E.T.? How did a movie that huge disappear from pop culture? Well, Lindsay Ellis has a video all about it, exclusively on Nebula, a creator-specific platform where you can watch great videos from other creators like H. Bomber Guy, Adam Neely, and myself. And now, if you sign up with my link, you get free access to Nebula Classes, where our creators host classes on how to be a creator. You will not only get access to all of the great stuff Nebula offers, plus classes, but you will get it for a little over $2.50 a month. And you'd also be directly supporting me, which, you know, I'd appreciate it. So click the link in the description and check it out below. Thank you for listening, and good night.